Chapter 411 Ariana, you don't look as fierce as you did back then. Blake, let's go to Aberforth. Dumbledore exclaimed with a spark of excitement in his eyes. He remembered that Aberforth had a portrait of Ariana, and Dumbledore couldn't help but think, if Ariana were still alive, she would surely want to meet Aberforth as well. Okay, I'll inform him first, Blake said, pulling out his wand to cast the Patronus charm. A pure white phoenix emerged, soaring out of the window into the sky. Fox, witnessing this, looked on in amazement. Dumbledore, slightly taken aback by the sight of Blake's phoenix Patronus, remarked, Your Patronus! Yes, as you can see, it's a phoenix, Blake replied, scratching his head somewhat awkwardly. Dumbledore smiled, a sense of happiness washing over him. He thought to himself that this young man was truly remarkable. Even Grindelwald, with all his power, couldn't conjure a Patronus. As Dumbledore was lost in thought, a pure white goat suddenly appeared, jumping onto his desk. It spoke with Aberforth's voice. Chi San San, come here. Before anyone could react, the goat dissipated into thin air. Blake nodded at Dumbledore, then opened a dimensional door directly to Aberforth's private room behind the Hogshead Bar. Having been there before, Blake was confident in his ability to navigate directly to Aberforth. Stepping through the dimensional gate, they found Aberforth already waiting by the sofa, an air of anticipation about him. Why the urgency? Aberforth inquired, noting the solemn expressions on the faces of his visitors. He could sense that something significant must have happened, especially since Blake's Patronus had come with a message of urgency, though without specifics. We need to go somewhere, Blake stated, hoping Aberforth would understand the gravity of the situation. I hope you can join us, Uncle Aberforth. Aberforth glanced towards the pub, still bustling with patrons. What's happened? There's no time to explain now. We'll discuss it on the way, Dumbledore interjected, his voice laced with eagerness. All right then, Aberforth conceded, asking a regular customer to keep an eye on the pub. He then rejoined the group in the back room. Blake's gaze was drawn to the oil painting of Ariana. She seemed to smile happily at Dumbledore, but upon noticing Blake's stare, she turned her face away, a hint of embarrassment coloring her features. Blake couldn't help but smile at the interaction. He had committed every detail of Ariana's likeness to memory. So, where are we headed? We must make haste. I need to return later to tend to my goats, Aberforth said, his tone gruff but tinged with curiosity. Dumbledore looked to Blake, knowing that the ability to reach Ariana rested in the young man's hands. Blake picked up his wand, closed his eyes, and began to draw circles in the air with a focused intensity. This was the first time he had opened a dimensional door with such solemnity since mastering supreme magic. A spark flew, and the familiar sound of the dimensional door opening filled the air, more thrilling than ever before. The door was opening, a sign that they had found what they were looking for. Yet, Dumbledore couldn't shake off a feeling of apprehension. What if they had found the wrong person? As the dimensional door fully opened, Blake stepped forward, followed closely by Dumbledore. Aberforth, though confused, trailed behind them. This is... Aberforth recognized the surroundings immediately. This is the Dumbledore family cemetery. Blake, why have you brought us here? Dumbledore whispered, his voice barely audible. To see Ariana, of course, he replied, his eyes suddenly widening with a mix of hope and disbelief. Aberforth snorted, it's about time you came to see Ariana. But his voice trailed off as he caught sight of a figure seated in front of a tombstone, her back to them. A woman, dressed in a manner that seemed both familiar and out of place in the cemetery, sat quietly, her presence a silent testament to the mysteries they were about to unravel. Wrapped in a black cloak and perched upon a stone, the figure remained shrouded in mystery until slender white hands emerged to check a pocket watch. It was only then that Blake and his companions could discern the figure was a woman. It's time, she announced, her voice breaking the silence as she slowly stood, letting her cloak and hat fall away. Her pale golden hair cascaded down her back, revealing her identity. You guys are really punctual, Ariana murmured, her voice tinged with a mixture of surprise and relief. This, this is impossible, Aberforth exclaimed, his voice laced with shock and disbelief. Aren't you, weren't you dead? I buried you with my own hands. Am I? Could this be a dream? 
Aberforth's voice trembled as he cautiously approached her, as if afraid that moving too quickly might shatter the fragile illusion before him. You're not dreaming, Ariana reassured him with a gentle smile, her blue eyes glistening with unshed tears. Standing before her two gray-haired brothers, Ariana looked remarkably youthful, as if she had just stepped out of Hogwarts, untouched by the passage of time. But, how? Even if you weren't dead, how could you remain so young? Or have you become a ghost? Aberforth's disbelief was palpable, his mind struggling to grasp the reality before him. Ariana slowly approached her brothers, taking their hands in hers. Feel this? The warmth of my hands, she said, a shy smile playing on her lips, reminiscent of the girl they once knew. Yes, I feel it. You're alive. Truly alive. Aberforth's joy was infectious, his earlier disbelief giving way to unbridled happiness as he celebrated the miraculous return of his sister. Dumbledore, too, was visibly moved, the warmth of Ariana's hand confirming the unbelievable truth. This is wonderful. You're indeed alive, he whispered, his usual composure replaced by a wave of emotion. I need to say, I'm sorry. I'm truly sorry, Dumbledore continued, his voice filled with regret. That day, I never intended for it to happen. You can't imagine how much I've regretted it. Blake watched the emotional reunion from a distance, his attention momentarily drawn to a ring on Ariana's finger. A surge of recognition coursed through him as he realized it was a ring of power, one he had no recollection of possessing. This could only mean one thing. The ring was from his future self. Indeed, this seems like something I would do, Blake mused, a hint of resignation in his voice. But how many eras will I traverse in the future? It seems I'm everywhere. What if? What if I can't return? The thought of being trapped in an endless cycle of time travel weighed heavily on Blake, the uncertainty of his future fostering a sense of unease. Blake, Ariana's voice pulled him from his thoughts. He looked up to find her standing before him, a warm smile on her face. Nice to see you again, she said, embracing him warmly. Um, Ariana? Auntie? Blake stammered, taken aback by her familiarity. You don't seem as intimidating as you were back then, Ariana teased, her smile widening. Ah, was I really that fierce? Blake replied, a sheepish grin on his face. I just hope I don't do anything too extreme in the future. Don't worry, I won't hold it against you. You were trying to save me after all, Ariana reassured him, placing the pocket watch in his hand. It's time to return this to you. As you said, this is reincarnation. Chapter 412 Why Does Ariana Talk So Much Like Me? Blake carefully examined his pocket watch, noting its pristine condition despite its age, a testament to its careful maintenance. However, after several inspections, he found nothing extraordinary about it. It was, by all appearances, just an ordinary pocket watch. Touching the glass cover, he noted the time. Ten past twelve. This meant that when he had stepped through the dimensional door to appear beside Ariana, it was precisely noon. Blake's lips twitched, hinting at words he wanted to say, but chose to keep to himself. He closed the watch and slipped it back into his pocket, dismissing his earlier thoughts. This was indeed an ordinary pocket watch, and his journey through time was not influenced by it. He speculated that his future self must have traveled back, completed his tasks, and left the watch with Ariana, instructing her to remain hidden from the Dumbledore family until their reunion at the Dumbledore Family Cemetery on September 2, 1993, at noon. As Blake pondered this, he watched Ariana engaging in conversation with the Dumbledore brothers. A sudden realization struck him. Could his future self be observing them at this very moment? The thought tempted him to use his truth-seeing abilities to scan the surroundings. However, an inexplicable sense of danger halted him. His intuition warned him of the potential consequences of overlooking even the smallest detail in time travel. Unsure of the impact of encountering his future self, Blake decided against it. Approaching Ariana, Blake inquired, Aunt Ariana, can you tell me how I will be able to time travel in the future? Aberforth and Dumbledore, having been briefed on the situation, listened intently, their concern evident. Ariana, noticing their anxious expressions, reassured them with a smile, I can't tell you, Blake, revealing that might influence your journey through time. But don't worry, in the future, you will have asked me this question, and I was instructed to tell you to let everything take its course. Blake sought clarification. 
So, you mean I should just let things happen naturally without intervening? Ariana confirmed. Exactly. Don't force anything. Just let events unfold as they will. She then addressed her brother's worries. I understand your concern for Blake's safety, but rest assured, he was unharmed when I met him. There's no need for any drastic actions. Stick to your original plans. Attend school, run the bar, and fulfill your duties as headmaster. Relieved by Ariana's words, Dumbledore responded, In that case, we can be at ease. Aberforth, wiping away tears, expressed his joy at seeing Ariana alive. You don't know how much I've mourned for you. Please, come home with me. Dumbledore interjected. Aberforth, Ariana should return to Godric's Valley, our ancestral home. This prompted an angry retort from Aberforth. Albus, are you challenging me? He blamed Dumbledore and another for Ariana's past troubles and was adamant about keeping her away from Dumbledore now. Dumbledore, removing his wizard hat in a gesture of sincerity, replied, I'm not looking for a dispute, Aberforth. Aberforth expressed his reluctance to let Ariana live in the disarray of his living quarters behind the pig's head bar. You can't expect her to stay in that mess. I'm not confident about it being suitable, Aberforth admitted, his voice betraying his concern. Dumbledore, seizing the moment of vulnerability, attempted to bridge the gap that years of resentment had built between them. Eberforth, now that Ariana is safe, perhaps it's time we put our differences aside? He proposed earnestly. Aberforth's response was laced with skepticism. Are you asking for my forgiveness? He questioned, his tone sharp. If that's how you want to interpret it, yes, I am, Dumbledore conceded, his voice heavy with regret. I acknowledge my past mistakes. I was too young and nearly caused irreparable harm. He continued, I've lived with this guilt for decades, enduring the punishment I deserved. Now, I find myself a solitary old man, haunted by the choices of my youth. Dumbledore's plea for forgiveness was heartfelt, revealing a vulnerability rarely seen. The loss and subsequent recovery of Ariana had reawakened a longing for familial bonds that he had suppressed for years. Contrary to what he had once told Harry, Dumbledore's true desire, as reflected in the mirror of Ericid, was not for simple comforts like wool socks, but for the reconciliation and unity of his family. Aberforth, initially resistant, softened under the influence of Ariana's gentle persuasion. The realization that the root of their estrangement, Ariana's well-being, was no longer a concern, coupled with her earnest plea, led him to reconsider. I've seen the toll these years have taken on you. Perhaps it's time to let go of our grievances, Aberforth conceded, though his words were tinged with reluctance. Ariana's joy was palpable, and Dumbledore's relief was evident. With the familial rift beginning to heal, Dumbledore suggested a practical solution to maintain their newfound closeness. Why not return to Godric's Hollow? I can arrange a flu network connection between my home and your tavern, making it easy for you to commute he offered, eager to facilitate their reconciliation. Aberforth was taken aback by Dumbledore's willingness to bend the rules for personal convenience, but was swayed by Ariana's gentle nudge towards acceptance. This unexpected gesture of familial care touched Aberforth, despite his initial reservations. As Dumbledore embraced Aberforth, an awkward but sincere gesture, Blake observed the scene, pondering the similarities between Ariana's words and his own. It dawned on him that his future interactions with Ariana might have influenced her, blending their styles and perspectives. The reconciliation between the Dumbledore brothers, facilitated by Blake's intervention and Ariana's plea, marked a poignant moment of healing and forgiveness. As Blake returned to Hogwarts, he reflected on the power of family bonds and the lengths to which one might go to mend them. It was already five o'clock in the afternoon, when Professor McGonagall, with a sense of urgency, escorted Blake to her office. Blake realized too late that in his haste that morning, he had forgotten to collect his class schedule. This oversight led to him inadvertently missing two herbology classes and two transfiguration classes. Fortunately, Blake possessed a quick wit. Before Professor McGonagall could resort to her usual disciplinary measures of deducting points or assigning detention, Blake cleverly mentioned that he had been assisting Dumbledore with a matter he couldn't disclose. He suggested that if Professor McGonagall required further details, she would need to inquire directly with Dumbledore himself. Reluctantly, Professor McGonagall let Blake go. 
After his release, Blake hurried to Professor Sprout's office to explain his absence. Professor Sprout, viewing Blake as a bright and responsible student, accepted his explanation without question. She only requested that Blake inform her in advance should such a situation arise again, offering her assistance if possible. She then encouraged Blake to get something to eat, acknowledging his likely hunger after such a busy day. Reflecting on the day's events, Blake appreciated Professor Sprout's concern. He realized he was indeed hungry, having spent the day performing various tasks, including preparing a room for his Aunt Ariana and Uncle Aberforth. Despite the adult's engagement in conversation, Blake found himself burdened with the responsibility of cleaning and organizing the room, a task decided by a unanimous vote, save for his own objection. Feeling overwhelmed, Blake sought the help of Dobby and Baker, two house elves, to manage the workload. Amidst his chores, Blake couldn't help but feel that Dumbledore had conveniently forgotten about his sister's needs in favor of other matters. Arriving at the dining hall, Blake made his way to the Hufflepuff table, oblivious to Hermione's puzzled gaze from the gawk adjacent Gryffindor table. Without hesitation, he began to order food, his appetite seemingly insatiable. Hermione, having already finished her meal, moved to sit behind Blake. She leaned in and whispered, expressing her disbelief at his absence from all his classes and warning him of Professor McGonagall's near fury. Blake, his mouth full of chicken, responded vaguely, assuring her that no points would be deducted as he had already clarified the situation with Professor McGonagall. Hermione, slightly annoyed by his secretive demeanor, expressed her frustration. Blake, still engrossed in his meal, continued to eat, undeterred by her admonishment. Blake offered Hermione a look of exasperation. Could I possibly have a bite to eat before we dive into questions, he pleaded. It is dinner time, after all. I haven't had anything to eat all day. It's, he added, his voice carrying a hint of weariness. Initially, Hermione felt a surge of irritation at his request, but her annoyance quickly faded when, when she processed his words. The thought of Blake going without food for an entire day stirred a sense of concern within her. It was utterly unlike him to miss a meal. The Blake she knew would never let that happen. What could possibly have happened to make you neglect even the most basic need for food? She wondered aloud her tone softening. Just as Blake opened his mouth to respond, Hermione gestured for him to pause. Actually, never mind. Let's talk about it after you've eaten, she decided, her voice laced with newfound understanding. She reached for a glass of pumpkin juice and handed it to him, then turned her attention back to her book, allowing Blake the space to eat in peace. Chapter 413, You Are All My Wings. Do you have the heart to let me lose one? In Godric's Hollow, within the quaint and cozy confines of Dumbledore's residence, the atmosphere was serene. By this time, Blake and Dumbledore had already made their way back to Hogwarts, leaving Aberforth and Ariana alone in the family home. Why have you remained so youthful after all these years? Aberforth inquired, his curiosity piqued. Ariana shook her head gently, a hint of melancholy in her voice. Aberforth, there are things I cannot divulge. Aberforth nodded, understanding the gravity of secrets untold. I see. Well, regardless of the reasons, I must say, you are perfect just as you are, far better than the aged appearance we've come to accept. You're almost exactly as I remember you. His words were sincere, reflecting a deep-seated nostalgia. Ariana, who appeared to be no older than eighteen, had managed to preserve her youthful visage, much to Aberforth's comfort. This was made possible by an inconspicuous ring on her right index finger, a gift from Blake. The ring, imbued with the power to resist the ravages of time, was a secret she was sworn to keep, even from her own brother. Meanwhile at Hogwarts, Blake sat with a mountain of empty plates before him, finally sated. Hermione, observing the spectacle, couldn't help but express her shock. Why have you suddenly become such a glutton? Blake, slightly embarrassed, attempted to downplay his appetite. Ahem, it's not as much food as it seems. It just looks like a lot, really. Despite his protestations, it was clear his appetite had indeed grown. Hermione, sensing Blake's discomfort, chose not to pry further. If there are things you'd rather not discuss, I won't press you. I should head to the library now, she said, gathering her books and shouldering her heavy bag. Blake's keen eyes caught a glimpse of a necklace hidden beneath Hermione's clothes, 
the chain the only visible part. He surmised it was a time-turner, a device that allowed Hermione to experience time at an accelerated pace, explaining her current state of exhaustion. Hermione, Blake called out, offering her a small bag. If you put your books in here, they won't be so heavy. Hermione accepted the bag with a weary smile, grateful for the gesture. As Hermione departed, Blake pondered the implications of the time-turner and his own experiences with time travel. His thoughts were abruptly interrupted by Cassandra's mocking tone. We haven't seen each other for just one day, and you're already missing her? She teased. Blake, turning to face Cassandra, greeted her with a smile. It seems you're recovering well, he remarked, noting the slight discomfort she tried to conceal. Standing up and stretching, Blake felt rejuvenated after his meal. Now that I'm full, it's time to focus on what comes next, he mused casting a glance at Cassandra, whose expression had shifted from mockery to curiosity. Cassandra's cheeks flushed slightly as she responded, Have you eaten? If so, are you interested in going somewhere with me? No, I'm not interested, Cassandra immediately refused. Come on, I'll show you something amazing. It's truly beautiful, Blake insisting Cassandra's hand and leading her out. No, I mean, I mean, I haven't eaten yet, so I won't go, Cassandra stammered regretting her interaction with Blake. If only she had known better, she wouldn't have engaged with him. Despite having finished her meal long ago, she lied about not having eaten, hoping to avoid being frightened by Blake in the room of requirement again. It's okay if you haven't eaten. I have some delicious food with me. I promise it will satisfy you, Blake assured her. How about, let's forget it. I, I just want to focus on the transfiguration paper, Professor McGonagall assigned for tonight, Cassandra tried to excuse herself. You can write it after you've seen what I want to show you, Blake countered. I, I, I'm in a hurry. But the transfiguration paper isn't due until next week. I, I want to get it day, one early. Then I'll help you finish it after you've seen it, Blake offered. Have finished? You, what are you planning now? Cassandra lamented, feeling a mix of confusion and apprehension as Blake half-pushed, half-pulled her out of the auditorium. Meanwhile, Peter Pettigrew was struggling with his own predicament. His body felt unusually weak, making it impossible for him to engage in any strenuous activities. The thought of running made his legs feel like jelly. Starving and unable to steal food, he had exhausted all his energy just escaping from Ronald's dormitory and evading Crookshank's watchful eye. The cat seemed to have a keen sense of his presence, following him at a distance whenever he moved. It was only by sneaking into a rarely opened secret passage that Peter managed to lose the cat. Despite his exhaustion, Peter was determined not to die. He remembered that the other exit of the secret passage was near the kitchen. He hoped to sneak in and find some leftovers, knowing well that the house elves would not take kindly to a mouse scavenging for food. Peter eventually found his way to the kitchen, located opposite the Hufflepuff common room, hidden behind a painting of pears. Unable to transform back into a human, he couldn't access the kitchen through the usual means. However, recalling his days roaming the school with James and the others as a mouse, he knew of a mouse hole that served as an entrance. Found it, Peter exclaimed silently, spotting the small hole. He was filled with excitement at the thought of finding food and hiding until Sirius was captured and returned to Azkaban. Then, he could safely reappear. Blake, where are you taking me? Cassandra asked, her voice tinged with nervousness as she noticed they were heading towards a more secluded area. The uncertainty made her heart race like a frightened deer. You haven't eaten yet. I'm taking you to a special place where you can eat, Blake replied nonchalantly, his casual demeanor doing little to ease Cassandra's growing apprehension. From the front, Cassandra hesitated. You. I'm not hungry. Huh? Not hungry? Are you sure? Blake asked, puzzled by her refusal. Cassandra, visibly frustrated, retorted, It's only been since this morning. Are you planning to tease me again tonight? Blake, taken aback, finally understood the misunderstanding. Little girl, how can your mind jump to such conclusions? He teased, lightly tapping Cassandra's head. What exactly do you think I'm up to? Dirty. I don't think you're one to talk. Cassandra snapped back, her glare sharp as knives. Blake cleared his throat awkwardly. Let's not dwell on the specifics. Cassandra turned away, 
her cheeks flushed with anger and perhaps a hint of embarrassment, refusing to engage further. So, are you coming or not? Blake changed the subject. Fine, Cassandra followed, albeit still annoyed. Blake led her to an oil painting depicting a dining car with a plate of pears on the table. He reached out, tickling the pear in the center, which, to Cassandra's astonishment, began to quiver as if ticklish. Suddenly, a clicking sound echoed from the wall behind the painting, and a knocker materialized on the pear. Blake grasped the knocker, pulling gently to reveal a door. What is this place? Cassandra asked, her curiosity piqued. Welcome to my favorite spot, the Hogwarts kitchen. Blake announced with a grin, stepping through the doorway. Cassandra hurried after him, her eyes widening at the sight. Wow, so many house elves, she exclaimed. Despite being from a pure-blood family with a house elf of her own, she had never seen so many working in unison. Blake greeted each house elf by name, complimenting their work, which sparked a wave of excitement among them. Oh, it's the honorable great Mr. Green, they cheered, clearly fond of Blake for his kindness and the small gifts he often brought them. Let's not keep you from your duties, Blake said, noticing the gathering crowd of elves. Oh, Mr. Green is so considerate, one elf praised. Blah, Key then requested something delicious for Cassandra, who hadn't eaten yet. The house elves, eager to please, quickly prepared a feast, setting up a table and chairs for them. The food arrived in abundance, making even Blake's mouth water. Please, enjoy your meal. If you need anything, just call for Palmer one of the elves said before returning to work. Blake expressed his gratitude to the elves, then turned to Cassandra. Come on, you haven't eaten yet, so you must be starving. Let's enjoy this feast together. Blake, with a gentle gesture, picked up a hot dog using a fork and carefully placed it on the empty plate before Cassandra. She nibbled on the savory treat, her large, emerald eyes flickering towards Blake with a mix of curiosity and apprehension. What's the matter? Aren't you fond of hot dogs? Blake inquired, noticing her hesitant demeanor. Cassandra set her fork down, her voice barely above a whisper. Did you, did you really refer to me as your, your girlfriend? Blake looked at her, genuinely surprised by her question. Yes, what about it? Is that not okay with you? Cassandra's cheeks flushed a deep shade of red. After a moment of contemplation, she voiced her concern. But what about Hermione? Blake chuckled a mischievous glint in his eyes as he, as he opened his palms and then clenched them into fists. Ah, of course, I want them all. Cassandra's expression hardened and she clenched her fist in frustration. You're unbelievable, I should have known. Blake quickly tried to soften the blow of his words. Listen, think of me as a bird. Each of you is a wing that keeps me aloft. Without one, how could I possibly fly? How miserable would that be? He looked at her earnestly, his voice tinged with a plea. Could you really bear to see me lose a wing? Blake's analogy, while unconventional, aimed to convey his deep affection and the unique value he placed on each of his relationships. However, his attempt to juggle his feelings for both Cassandra and Hermione was a delicate balance, fraught with complexity and the potential for heartache. Chapter 414 Cassandra You are so bad. I like you so much. Is there a possibility that you don't actually have to be like a little bird? Cassandra asked, her voice strained as if she was trying to hold back her frustration. As long as you are a good person, you don't need wings, she added, emphasizing the words good person with a louder tone. Blake's desire for everything, coupled with the thought of being inappropriate, infuriated her. Ah, don't you want to be a little bird? She teased. Well, be good and don't be a little bird, okay? Then I'll be an angel, Blake retorted playfully. Ah, an angel? Cassandra was puzzled. Let me think. According to legend, there's an angel. What's his name? He has six wings, not twelve, right? Blake mused, trying to recall. You, you're aiming for ten. Twelve wings? Ah, Blake, I will fight you! Cassandra exclaimed, her frustration turning into a playful challenge. Meanwhile, at Hogwarts, Professor McGonagall entered the headmaster's office with a question on her mind. Albus, Blake spent the entire first day of the new term causing trouble, she reported. Listen to him, is he doing something for you? She inquired, noticing Dumbledore's amused expression as he carefully placed a box of cockroaches back on the table. Oh, of course, of course. Ahem, yes, he is indeed helping me today, Dumbledore responded with a smile, trying to downplay the situation. 
So, you've enlisted an underage wizard for a task? Professor McGonagall pressed, her brow furrowing slightly. Well, it's not a dangerous task, Minerva. It's a joyous occasion, a significant event for the entire Dumbledore family, Dumbledore explained, standing up, his face glowing with excitement. Professor McGonagall was taken aback by Dumbledore's enthusiasm. In all her years, she had never seen him so elated, not even when peace was restored to the wizarding world after dark times. Ahem, sorry, I'm just overly excited and happy, Dumbledore quickly composed himself, realizing he had let his emotions get the better of him. The loss of his sister Ariana had weighed heavily on him for years, and now, the impossible had happened. Ariana was not only alive, but had returned home, looking healthier than ever. Even Aberforth, with whom he had a strained relationship, was now willing to reconcile and move back home. The family love that once seemed out of reach was now within grasp. Dumbledore worried momentarily that this might all be a dream, yet even if it were, it would be the most beautiful dream of his life. What happened? You seem unusually excited, Albus, Professor McGonagall expressed her concern, knowing Dumbledore to be eccentric but not to this extent. I can't reveal too much, Minerva, Dumbledore began, his smile returning. My sister Ariana, she's back. Coming back means... Professor McGonagall was confused. She's back. She's not dead. She's never been dead, Dumbledore exclaimed, unable to contain his joy. Ariana's return was a matter that could no longer be kept secret, especially since she had openly moved back to Godric's Hollow. Merlin, Albus, you're acting very strangely today, Professor McGonagall remarked, half convinced Dumbledore had lost his senses. Wait here, I'm going to call Pomona over now and show you, she said, preparing to leave. Oh, no, I'm not crazy, Minerva, Dumbledore quickly interjected, trying to reassure her. Hmm, crazy people always say they are not crazy. Professor McGonagall sighed, concerned that Dumbledore was under too much pressure. What I'm telling you is true, Minerva, Dumbledore insisted. Back then, someone rescued her. Sorry, I can't disclose the details. For some reason, she couldn't see us until today, when she suddenly returned. She has moved back to my home in Godric's Hollow, and Aberforth has also agreed to move back, Dumbledore concluded, hoping to convince Professor McGonagall of the miraculous turn of events. He forgave me. Do you understand why I'm so happy now? Professor McGonagall's screw, tenies Dumbledore's expression, searching for any hint of irrationality. Finding none, she allowed herself to tentatively accept his words. All right. But regarding Blake in this situation, Dumbledore anticipated McGonagall's question about Blake's involvement but found himself at a loss for words. He possesses a very powerful teleportation spell, as I've mentioned before, Dumbledore explained. Today, I couldn't wait to return home, so I needed his assistance. Professor McGonagall raised an eyebrow in suspicion. So, he spent the entire day using teleportation magic? Minerva, Ariana is the child's aunt, Dumbledore gently reminded her. He had to meet with Ariana, then arrange her room, purchase daily necessities, and so on. It understandably took a bit longer. Okay, Professor McGonagall reluctantly conceded. If what you're saying is true, then this is indeed a cause for celebration. Her primary concern had been for Dumbledore's mental well-being. Now it appeared that this seemingly preposterous story held truth. Understanding Dumbledore's excitement, she offered her congratulations. Congratulations, Albus. Thank you, Minerva. I'm planning a small gathering at my home in Godric's Hollow this weekend, Dumbledore shared. I intend to introduce Ariana to our closest friends and colleagues at the dinner. Aware of McGonagall's lingering doubts and anticipating skepticism from others, Dumbledore hoped that a personal introduction would dispel any disbelief. I'll certainly attend, Professor McGonagall confirmed, having previously seen Ariana's portrait at the Hogshead Inn. She believed that seeing Ariana in person would confirm her identity. As Professor McGonagall turned to leave, Dumbledore called out, Wait, Minerva! Is there something else, Albus? It's about Blake. Dumbledore began, his gaze serious. From now on, if Blake misses a class, there's no need to worry. Just inform me, and please relay this to the other professors as well. Professor McGonagall stared at Dumbledore, astonished. Was he really suggesting that Blake be allowed to skip classes without consequence? May I ask why? She inquired, striving for calm. Dumbledore reflected on his conversation with Ariana, 
who had described Blake's extraordinary abilities and the unconventional methods he used to help her. It was clear to Dumbledore that Blake had acquired these skills outside the standard curriculum, likely during his own time. It's better not to confine him with classes that no longer serve his learning needs, Dumbledore reasoned. It might hinder his ability to acquire new skills, potentially affecting his time travel endeavors. Dumbledore's request to be notified of Blake's absences was driven by his desire to be promptly informed should Blake embark on his time travel journey. If Blake were to disappear from Hogwarts without a trace, it would signal the beginning of his journey. Emerging from his reverie, Dumbledore gazed at Professor McGonagall, who wore an expression of confusion. Ah, Minerva, this child, he has a unique destiny, Dumbledore began, his voice tinged with a solemnity that commanded attention. There are tasks that only he can undertake. After all, have we ever encountered a young wizard as extraordinary as him? As Dumbledore's words sank in, Professor McGonagall found herself reflecting on Blake's remarkable defiance, and despite her reservations, she found herself nodding in agreement. You mean to say you can't disclose the specifics of his mission, correct? She inquired, seeking clarity. Unfortunately, Minerva, that is the case, Dumbledore replied, his tone apologetic. Professor McGonagall nodded, her understanding evident. I see. Don't worry, Albus. If it's something you cannot share, I won't press further. I intend to inform the other professors. However, explaining it directly might be challenging. I'll simply say that you have a particular fondness for the students and tend to indulge them. I trust you have no objections? She added, a hint of concern in her vaubore. Ice. Dumbledore offered a wry smile, shaking his head. No objections at all. It seems I'm destined to be a doting headmaster from this day forward. You're right, Minerva. And remember, there's no need to mention this to Blake. If he attends class, so be it. If not, let it be. We'll let nature take its course, Dumbledore advised, his voice calm yet firm. Understood. Honestly, whether Blake attends class or not doesn't really affect his abilities. Professor McGonagall conceded as she left the headmaster's office and made her way to the staff lounge. Upon arriving, she took a moment to compose herself before forcefully opening the door. It's preposterous. Albus is actually allowing Blake such liberties, she exclaimed, her voice echoing through the room. Minerva, what happened? Professor Flitwick inquired, concern evident in his voice. Today, Blake missed an entire day of school, so I spoke with Dumbledore. He said that from now on, if Blake misses school, we're merely to inform him. No solitary confinement, no deduction of points. This is sheer indulgence, she explained, frustration clear in her tone. Meanwhile, in the room of requirement, Cassandra sat exhausted, her body limp. Blake, with a smile, asked, Are you satisfied, or do you wish to continue our duel? Cassandra, too weary to respond, had clearly underestimated Blake's prowess. No one had ever withstood more than an hour against Blake's formidable skills. After administering a restorative potion to Cassandra, she soon regained her strength. You, you're terrible, she exclaimed, yet her tone betrayed a hint of admiration. And yet, you seem to enjoy it, Blake teased, his smile widening. Before he could continue, Cassandra wrapped herself around him. Why stop now? I don't care if you aim to be a 24-winged angel. Can we continue what we started, she pleaded, her addiction to Blake's skills evident. Blake, however, gently lifted her chin and replied softly, Not now. I have other matters to attend to. What could possibly be more important? Cassandra asked, her voice weak yet curious. I need to catch someone. Actually, I was on my way to the kitchen when you challenged me. To avoid alarming the house elves, I teleported us here, Blake explained. Cassandra, gathering her strength, stood up. I want to be more involved in your world, she declared. All right, but tidy yourself up first, Blake suggested, his gaze encouraging. Blushing, Cassandra adjusted her disheveled attire and retrieved a small mirror from her bag to fix her makeup. Meanwhile, Blake utilized his eyes of truth to survey the castle. After a moment, Cassandra announced she was ready. With the aid of powerful magic, she had quickly restored her appearance to its usual elegance. Then, let's proceed, Blake said, ready to face whatever challenges awaited them, together. Let's go, Blake said, opening the dimensional door and stepping through with confidence. Cassandra, her face alight with excitement, followed closely behind him. 
As Cassandra's eyes adjusted to the sudden shift from light to darkness, she realized they had arrived in a dimly lit space. Lumos, Blake whispered, casting the spell with a gentle flick of his wand. A soft, glowing light emerged from the tip, growing brighter with each second. With a deft motion, Blake directed the light towards the ceiling, where it scattered, illuminating the surroundings more with each passing moment. As the area lit up, Cassandra gasped in surprise, realizing they had emerged into a secret passage. In the center of this hidden corridor, a hairless rat trembled, caught in the sudden illumination. Chapter 415 Snape, it's over! My image! In the dimly lit secret passage, a small trembling figure huddled against the cold stone wall. It was a mouse, naked and shivering, surrounded by scraps of food it had scavenged in desperation. Peter Pettigrew, in his animagus form, was in a state of panic. He had been greedily consuming the meager food he found, when suddenly a door of sparkling light materialized before him. To his dismay, the figure that emerged was none other than the young wizard who had previously inflicted upon him a pain he couldn't forget. Peter tried to make himself as small as possible, hoping against hope that this encounter was merely a coincidence. However, his hopes were dashed by a clear, youthful voice. Is this that Weasley's pet rat? Cassandra exclaimed in surprise, her memory of the distasteful rodent still vivid from an incident on the train the day before. Um, yes, it's Ronald's pet rat, Scabbers, Blake confirmed, squatting down to meet the rat's gaze with a smile that felt as sharp as a knife. Peter felt a chill run down his spine, but he clung to a sliver of hope. Recognized only as Scabbers, he might simply be returned to Ron, buying him some time before Sirius Black's arrival at Hogwarts. Quickly, Peter slipped back into his well-rehearsed role, the innocent pet rat hoping to deceive them once more. Blake, you mentioned wanting to show me something. Surely it wasn't just this mouse? Cassandra asked, her voice tinged with disgust. Yes, it's him, Blake corrected, emphasizing the pronoun, which caught both Cassandra and Peter off guard. Peter's heart raced, but he tried to reassure himself that it was merely a slip of the tongue. Him? Why refer to it as such? Is there something special about this mouse? Cassandra inquired, her curiosity piqued. Indeed, very special, Blake replied, turning his attention back to the rat with a welcoming smile. Hello, my name is... Blake. At the sound of the name, Peter couldn't help but squeak in terror, despite knowing Blake's connection to the name. Don't worry, I'm not the booker you're thinking of, Blake reassured softly, his words slicing through Peter's last hopes like a knife. Cassandra watched the bizarre scene unfold, questioning Blake's sanity. However, Blake was about to reveal a truth that would shock her to the core. This remarkable mouse is not only Ronald's pet, Scabbers, but also a celebrated hero of the wizarding world, Mr. Peter Pettigrew, awarded the first-class order of Merlin over a decade ago. Blake announced with a sly grin. Peter felt utterly defeated, wondering how Blake had uncovered his secret. Cassandra stared at Blake in disbelief. You mean this mouse is actually a person who is believed to be dead? She asked, her voice trembling with a mix of fear and astonishment. Blake lightly tapped her on the head, chiding her gently. You're a witch, surrounded by ghosts at Hogwarts, and yet you fear them? But if he's not dead, then how? Cassandra's confusion was evident, her mind still reeling from earlier revelations. Because he's an animagus, Blake explained, drawing his wand and pointing it at Peter. Reveal yourself. With a simple spell, Peter's form began to change dramatically. Cassandra stepped back, half expecting an explosion, but instead, she witnessed a transformation that would forever alter her understanding of the wizarding world. Peter Pettigrew's mouse form expanded and morphed, revealing the man who had been hiding in plain sight. After a moment, the spot where Banbon had been lying transformed, revealing a trembling, short, fat man in tattered clothes. Cassandra covered her mouth, her eyes wide with shock at the scene unfolding before her. Fay, te, ti, she stuttered. Well, it's the transformation of an animagus, Blake explained calmly. At this revelation, Peter Pettigrew was stunned. He had believed it impossible for him to revert to his human form. How was Blake able to change him back with what seemed like a simple spell? Struggling to his feet, Peter Ray realized he hadn't stood upright in over a decade. The world looked different from this height, unfamiliar and strange. You, I couldn't change back before. Did you do something to me? 
Peter asked, his voice tinged with a mix of fear and curiosity. Despite his timid nature, Peter was no fool. He quickly connected his recent transformations to Blake. It was clear to him now, all the misfortunes he had faced recently couldn't just be coincidences, especially considering the incident with the knife Blake had used on himself on the train. Feeling a sudden emptiness, Peter nearly broke down. He was convinced that Blake had orchestrated everything deliberately. That's right, I placed some magic spells on you and then had Ronald give you some pills. Blake admitted freely, confirming Peter's fears. Now, do you feel that your animagus transformation has failed and you're weak again? I beg you, please spare me. I'll do anything for you. Peter pleaded, seeing an opportunity to survive by offering his services to Blake. He knew that if Blake decided to hand him over to Dumbledore, his fate would be sealed. Peter attempted to grasp Blake's leg in a gesture of desperation, but Blake, with a simple flick of his wrist, sent Peter flying backward. He hit an invisible barrier, crashed into the wall, and then slid down to the ground, knocked into a state of painful clarity. Blake turned his attention away from the crumpled figure of Peter Pettigrew and addressed Cassandra. Do you understand now? Yes, I think I do, Cassandra replied, her mind racing with the implications. So, the wanted criminal Sirius was actually innocent. The Daily Prophet had it all wrong. Cassandra pieced together the truth about the events of that year, realizing the depth of Peter Pettigrew's betrayal. How did you know he was Peter Pettigrew? She asked Blake. It's a long story. I'll tell you about it later, Blake responded, avoiding a direct answer. Cassandra nodded, accepting his response, but couldn't help asking another question. But you knew he was Peter Pettigrew for a while. Why didn't you expose him when we were on the carriage? Blake shrugged, crafting a convenient lie. I didn't know he was Peter Pettigrew at that time. It was only today at noon that I learned from someone that he was an animagus and his form was a mouse with a missing right paw. Blake chose not to reveal the full extent of his knowledge or how he came to learn of Peter's true identity, keeping the details of his system and the treasure chests to himself. He had not planned to expose Peter Pettigrew so soon, preferring to wait until a more opportune moment. However, the unexpected return of Ariana and the potential for unforeseen time travel forced his hand. He realized that any delay could result in missing the opportunity to deal with Peter Pettigrew once and for all. To eliminate the scourge, Blake knew he would regret it if he didn't act swiftly. Thus he decided it was best to address such troublesome matters immediately, while he still had the advantage of being in this timeline. The allure of additional treasure chests couldn't justify taking such a risk. Unaware of the depth of Blake's considerations, Cassandra listened to his explanation without objection. So that's your plan. What will you do next? She asked. After a moment of thought, Blake responded, Help me open a few dimensional doors, and then let's find the professors. I've already cleared Dumbledore and Lupin's treasure chests today. Since I'm not waiting for their chests to refresh, we might as well involve the other major subject professors and clear theirs too. The situation with Peter Pettigrew should suffice to unlock their chests. Let's maximize our gains. Cassandra appeared hesitant, which prompted Blake to inquire, What's the issue? Embarrassed, Cassandra admitted, I, I can only open one dimensional door at a time. Oh, that's fine. Just help me find Professor Snape, Blake said nonchalantly, making Cassandra smile. She realized Blake didn't truly need her assists, Tance. He was simply making her feel included. Without further ado, Blake opened several dimensional doors. Cassandra, pushing aside her thoughts, concentrated hard on Snape's appearance and name, and successfully opened her dimensional door. The secret passage, already illuminated by Blake's fluorescent spell, brightened even further with the opening of the doors. Cassandra was relieved her door functioned properly at such a crucial moment. However, as she was about to speak to Snape, she was rendered speechless by an unexpected sight. Snape, wearing a tender smile, was feeding a baby with an exquisite bottle, a can of milk powder open nearby. When Snape's gaze met Cassandra's, the smile on his face froze. My image is completely ruined. Snape thought despairingly. What happened? Professor McGonagall entered through a dimensional door, curious about the commotion. Aha! I've heard about this magic of yours! exclaimed Professor Flitwick, 
dropping his books in excitement. Professor Sprout, armed with a shovel and a wand, and Professor Lupin, expressing surprise, joined the gathering, each eager to assist. Snape, trying to maintain his composure despite holding a baby bottle, glanced at Cassandra and discreetly pocketed the bottle. Professor Babbling, in her nightgown, and Dumbledore, with traces of cockroach sprinkles in his beard, indicating his hurried arrival, also stepped through the dimensional doors, intrigued by Blake's discovery. Blake, having gathered everyone's attention, announced, I found Peter Pettigrew. Peter Pettigrew? Are you joking? Peter died more than ten years ago, Professor McGonagall skeptically remarked. Look over there, Blake directed, pointing to the wall behind the group. The professors turned to see the previously obscured sight of Peter Pettigrew, the short, fat, middle-aged man lying on the ground, now visible with the dimensional doors closed. What? This is really Peter? The professors exclaimed in unison, shocked by the revelation. McGonagall's voice was laced with shock as she spoke. The instant Lupin's gaze fell upon Peter, a fiery rage ignited in his eyes, turning them a fierce red. Clenching his teeth tightly, he bellowed, Peter Pettigrew! Chapter 416 I would rather die than betray my comrades. Peter, Lupin roared, attempting to surge forward, but Dumbledore quickly restrained him. Without Dumbledore's intervention, there was no telling the extent of the beating Peter Pettigrew would have received from the incensed Lupin. What's happening with him now? Dumbledore inquired, eyeing Peter, who appeared disoriented and unaware of his surroundings. He's just unconscious. I knocked him out. Blake clarified. That's a relief, Dumbledore responded with a nod. Peter's survival was crucial. He was a key witness. His death would mean Sirius Black's name could not be fully cleared. The Ministry of Magic needed irrefutable evidence to acknowledge its mistake and exonerate Sirius. Despite Sirius's extensive combat experience, his alleged betrayal was something many found hard to believe and understand. Now, with the truth unveiled and Sirius proven innocent, Dumbledore was more determined than ever to assist him. After all, as Harry's godfather, Sirius was one of the boy's few remaining relatives. Dumbledore approached Peter to assess his condition, while Professor McGonagall, visibly confused, pressed for an explanation. It seemed only a select few were privy to the full story, leaving her and others like Professors Flitwick, Sprout, and Babbling in the dark. Snape, on the other hand, initially seemed to relish the unfolding drama among the marauders, but his smugness soon gave way to disgust when Dumbledore tasked him with administering a potion to awaken Peter. As Lupin's fury abated, McGonagall and the others were finally briefed on the events. To avoid implicating Blake unnecessarily, there was an initial hesitation to mention his role in summoning the spirits of Lily and James Potter. However, omitting this detail would leave too many questions unanswered, particularly how they discovered Peter was the secret keeper and not dead, as believed. This revelation might suggest betrayal, but it could also indicate desperate circumstances. The disclosure of Blake's ability to summon the spirits of Lily and James left everyone, including McGonagall, in shock. Meanwhile, Blake couldn't help but smile as he noticed an additional diamond treasure chest and four gold chests in his system space, a reward for his actions. Lupin then shared how he, along with James, Sirius, and Peter, became Animagi in their fifth year to support him. McGonagall, herself an Animagus, was astounded. She knew all too well the dangers and challenges of undergoing such a transformation without guidance. The risk of failure was high, with death being a merciful outcome compared to the possibility of becoming a grotesque half-human, half-animal creature. That Peter had succeeded was as astonishing to her as if Neville Longbottom had topped their class. Snape's lips curled in displeasure when Professor McGonagall praised James Potter and his friends for their talent. The conversation took a serious turn when Lupin revealed that James and Sirius had privately discussed changing their secret keeper to Peter Pettigrew. Professor McGonagall was shocked. Peter, how could he? she exclaimed. The truth was hard to swallow. The real traitor was indeed the new secret keeper, Peter Pettigrew. The Fidelius charm protected a location so thoroughly that unless the secret keeper willingly divulged the secret, not even Voldemort could find it even if he stood right at the doorstep. Professor McGonagall was bewildered. Peter, the timid and seemingly harmless one, 
had betrayed his best friend's entire family, friends who had supported him since childhood. She found it easier to believe Sirius was the traitor than to accept Peter's betrayal. Yet, evidence suggested that Peter had been leaking information to Voldemort long before he became the secret keeper. It was a devastating realization for McGonagall, who felt a deep sense of betrayal. The Order of the Phoenix had gone to great lengths to protect many, including Peter, who offered little in battle. To think that he had stabbed them in the back wa, son bearable. Oh, James and Lily must have been so heartbroken, McGonagall murmured sadly. Lupin, struggling to contain his anger, shared that Blake suspected Ronald Weasley's pet rat, Scabbers, to be Peter Pettigrew in his animagus form. This suspicion arose because Sirius had been closely following the Hogwarts Express, presumably in search of Peter. Initially, they thought Sirius was after Harry, but it became clear he was hunting for Peter. Their search led to a dead end when they believed Peter had been eaten by a cat. However, Blake had recently used a dimensional door to summon them, revealing that Peter had been captured. The room fell silent as everyone processed the information. Professor Lewi broke the silence, expressing concern for Sirius, who was wanted by the Ministry of Magic and at risk of being captured by the Dementors. Dumbledore reassured them that Sirius, being an animagus, could evade the Dementors by staying in his animal form. However, McGonagall worried about the risk of Sirius being captured before they could clear his name. Dumbledore inquired if Blake's teleportation magic could locate Sirius. Blake explained that his magic required the person's name and current appearance, making it impossible to find Sirius, who was likely disguised as a large black dog, a description too vague given the number of black dogs in the world. The group was left in a somber mood, grappling with the complexity of their situation and the betrayal that had led them here. The revelation about Peter Pettigrew's treachery and the challenge of protecting Sirius from the Ministry's pursuit weighed heavily on their minds. Dumbledore pondered for a moment before speaking. If that's the case, then we must act swiftly to clear his name. He continued, A quick rehabilitation by the Ministry of Magic should ensure his safety. Professor Flitwick agreed. Indeed, we have no other option. He should be safe for the time being, but we must act quickly. Dumbledore's gaze then shifted to Snape, who had been observing the situation with a detached indifference. Turning his attention to Peter Pettigrew, who lay on the ground feigning death, Dumbledore said, Severus, if you would. Snape, with a sneer, revealed his awareness of Peter's act. Get up, stop your pretense, he said sharply, delivering a harsh kick to Peter's ribs. The kick elicited a pained scream from Peter, effectively ending his charade. Peter, now upright but trembling, attempted a laugh that only betrayed his fear and despair. The accusatory stares from those around him felt like daggers. After years of hiding, Peter's regret was undeniable. Peter, do you have anything to say for yourself? Dumbledore asked, his calm tone belied by the underlying sternness. I didn't betray them, I swear! Peter protested, his voice shaking. Still lying? Lupin, overcome with anger, knocked Peter to the ground before Dumbledore intervened. Remus, please, calm down. Dumbledore then addressed Peter. Your denial changes nothing. You could have died a hero, yet you chose to live in hiding as a pet for over a decade. This alone is suspicious enough for the Ministry to consider using Veritaserum. The mention of Veritaserum sent a wave of panic through Peter. He knew he couldn't withstand its effects. Severus, do you have Veritaserum with you? Dumbledore inquired. Of course, Snape replied, producing a bottle from his pocket, originally intended for Harry Potter, but now repurposed for Peter. No, please no. Peter begged, retreating as Blake approached with the potion, his presence reminding Peter of his worst nightmares. Why not? Blake challenged. If you're innocent, then prove it. Drink the serum and answer our questions truthfully. What are you afraid of? Cornered and desperate, Peter attempted to transform and escape, but his animagus abilities had yet to return. Trapped and overwhelmed by despair, he became hysterical. I had no choice. The Dark Lord's power is unmatched. How could anyone resist? I just wanted to survive. Lupin, Few, Russ, retorted, Survive? And what of those who died protecting you? What would James and Lily think? They wanted to live too. They treated you kindly, and yet you betrayed them. Yes, you survived. But can you truly say you've lived in peace? 
Peter's legs gave out, and he collapsed onto the ground, overwhelmed by a surge of regret that he had long tried to suppress. No, you don't understand, he stammered, his voice barely above a whisper. You can't comprehend the terror of facing the Dark Lord. I bet if you were in my shoes, confronted by him, you too would have yielded. Lupin's response was fierce, his anger palpable. Would I have compromised? Let me make this clear, Peter. I would rather face death than betray my friends, my closest companions, in such a manner. His voice grew louder, more impassioned. If it were me, I would have stood my ground, wand at the ready to fight him to the last. Even if my wand were snapped in half, even if my limbs were shattered, I would still resist, using my teeth if I had to. That's the difference between us. It's not about so-called compromise. It's about loyalty and courage in the face of darkness. Chapter 417 Potions class? That's okay. You have no idea how terrifying he is. Whenever you're in front of him, you'll be just like me. Peter screamed, his voice laced with hysteria. It seemed that by emphasizing Voldemort's terror, he sought to diminish the shame that gnawed at his heart. You shameless coward, Lupin retorted, his anger palpable. You're timid and fearful, having never faced the true horrors of battle. You're oblivious to the countless times we've stood against that dark figure, challenging him. You can't even begin to comprehend the bravery of those who faced him in a duel and paid the ultimate price, Lupin continued, his voice rising with each word. I've never witnessed a comrade so paralyzed by fear that they surrendered without a fight. You're an insult to the memory of those who died fighting for peace. Had someone not intervened, Lupin looked ready to unleash his fury on Peter. Professor McGonagall's gaze on Peter was filled with disappointment. Peter, I never imagined you would sink to this, she said, her voice heavy with disillusionment. Dumbledore, pinching the bridge of his nose in frustration, intervened. Let's secure him for now. Severus. Snape, with a nod, approached Peter, who lay on the ground, his expression one of utter disgust. However, Peter's paralyzed state rendered him unable to support his own weight, complicating Snape's attempt to lift him. At that moment, Blake stepped forward and with a smile placed a pill into Peter's mouth. The action was so swift that Peter couldn't react in time. By the time he realized what had happened, the pill had already dissolved. What, what did you give me? Peter shouted, panic-stricken. Poison, Blake replied, his tone menacing. No, you can't poison me, Peter pleaded, terror-stricken. If you kill me, there'll be no one to prove Sirius's innocence. Peter's fear of death was evident. He preferred the dread of Azkaban over the finality of death. But as panic consumed him, he noticed something astonishing. His animagus abilities had returned, and the weakness that had plagued his body had vanished. His strength was fully restored. Without pausing to ponder the source of his sudden recovery, Peter seized the moment and transformed into a mouse, hoping to escape. Snape, caught off guard by the transformation, felt a slight touch in his hand, before Peter, now a mouse, vanished, leaving behind only his tattered coat. Squeak! Peter, in his mouse form, darted out from under the coat, seeing this as his only chance at freedom. But his escape was short-lived. Suddenly, Peter found himself suspended in mid-air, immobilized. Dumbledore approached, elder wand in hand, while Blake followed, a cage ready. Blake sneered at the mouse, now a picture of despair. With the forces present here, even Voldemort himself would think twice before facing us. What made you think you could escape? Indeed, the combined might of Dumbledore and the present professors was formidable, enough to deter even Voldemort at his peak. Blake opened the cage, and with a simple gesture, Peter was drawn into it. As the cage door shut, Peter regained his ability to move, but found himself trapped. Peter frantically pounded against the cage, but it was futile. The cage crafted from alchemical materials by Blake was impervious to his efforts. Realizing the futility of his actions, Peter quickly abandoned any thought of transforming back into his human form to escape. His instinct to preserve his own life prevailed, and he ceased his resistance. Blake handed the cage to Snape, remarking, Now, Severus, that's much easier to manage. Snape, with a look of disdain, accepted the cage. Indeed, handling a caged mouse was far simpler than dealing with Peter's corpulent form. A man weighing more than 200 kilograms peered down at the cage with a mix of fascination and regret. The craftsmanship of this cage is remarkable. 
It's just a shame it's being used to confine a mere mouse, he lamented. It's not a shame at all. If I melt it down later, I could craft you a crucible or something of the sort. Blake responded nonchalantly. Snape's mouth twitched in disdain before he declared emphatically, I will never accept any cauldron you offer me in the future. Dumbledore, too, believed that incarcerating Peter in this manner was far safer than allowing him to remain in human form. In his human guise, Peter could potentially cast spells without a wand. However, as an animagus transformed into an animal, he was no different from any ordinary creature. To ensure Peter's secure containment, Dumbledore even went so far as to reinforce the cage with additional curses before Snape's departure, underscoring the gravity with which he viewed Peter's capture. With Peter securely imprisoned, everyone present exhaled a collective sigh of relief. However, as the group prepared to depart the secret passageway, Dumbledore requested Blake to remain behind. How did you manage to identify Peter among countless other rats? Dumbledore inquired, prompting those who were about to leave to pause and listen. Given the prevalence of rats in Hogwarts, especially within its extensive network of underground pipes, pinpointing Peter specifically was a mystery that intrigued everyone. Blake replied with a hint of modesty. Actually, it wasn't much of a challenge. I've been famished all day, which has left my mind somewhat clouded, preventing me from thinking clearly, he added, causing Dumbledore to awkwardly stroke his beard, well aware of the reason behind Blake's hunger. Ahem, my apologies, that was an oversight on my part, Dumbledore said, retrieving a box of sweets from his pocket. Here, take this new box of cockroach clusters. They're an experimental flavor the manufacturer wanted me to sample. I couldn't bring myself to try them. Blake pushed the box back with a look of disgust. Ahem, if they're that precious, you should keep them for yourself. I'm not particularly fond of sweets, especially not cockroach clusters. Dumbledore's willingness to consume candies resembling cockroaches, regardless of their sweetness, baffled Blake. He had always found the concept of cockroach clusters as unappealing as an inflatable doll with the likeness of Sister Feng. Functional, perhaps, but utterly repulsive. It's quite straightforward, actually. As I mentioned earlier, I've never encountered Sirius in his animagus form, so locating him was impossible. However, I have encountered Peter in his animagus form. To be precise, I even conducted a physical examination of him on the train. Once I recalled this, identifying him was simple, Blake explained. Dumbledore nodded, finally understanding. I see. After providing his explanation, Blake was eager to return to the Room of Requirement and engage in some entertaining activities with Cassandra. However, Dumbledore halted him once more. Blake, could you please transport me to the Ministry of Magic? I need to discuss this matter with Minister Fudge in person. Writing letters is too time-consuming, and the situation cannot be adequately explained in writing, Dumbledore requested. Of course, Blake agreed, and with a wave of his hand, a dimensional gate materialized before them, leading to an alley adjacent to a red phone booth in London. Dumbledore stepped through, inhaling the familiar scent of London's streets, and made his way toward the phone booth, his wizard hat perched atop his head. Blake watched him go before closing the dimensional gate. Turning around, Blake caught sight of Professor Flitwick, whose eyes sparkled with curiosity. Blake, what sort of magic was that? In all my years of studying magic, I've never encountered anything like it. Blake offered a patient explanation. Professor, that wasn't a spell. Strictly speaking, it's not magic, at least not magic from this world. Are you suggesting that was magic from another world? Flitwick gasped, intrigued. It could be understood that way. Essentially, this power is borrowed, Blake clarified as sunlight streamed through the window, illuminating his faco. E. Blake woke up with a start, squinting as he glanced at his pocket watch. It's only eleven o'clock in the morning. Wait, eleven o'clock? His eyes widened in shock. It's broken. I have a morning class. In a rush, Blake grabbed his class schedule, scanning it quickly. Potions class? Oh, that's okay. I can take it easy. With a nonchalant toss, the schedule landed back on the bed as Blake laid down once more. The night before had been exhausting. After resolving the Peter Pettigrew situation, Blake found himself cornered by the inquisitive Professor Flitwick and Professor Barbling, who engaged him in a lengthy discussion about advanced magic. 
By the time he managed to extricate himself, he was too tired to entertain any thoughts of mischief with Cassandra. He returned to his dormitory, covered his head, and fell into a deep sleep. Despite his enhanced physical condition, Blake was still not accustomed to losing even a few hours of sleep. However, Blake's rest was short-lived. He soon got up again, driven by a simple yet compelling reason, hunger. Having missed breakfast, he quickly got ready and dashed to the dining hall, hoping to be the first in line for the meal. As he reached the first floor, Blake caught a glimpse of Hermione rushing by. He intended to greet her, but she turned a corner before he could. Curious, Blake followed, only to find the corridor empty. Puzzled, he mused, she just traveled through time and space, right? His thoughts were interrupted by a cat's meow. Looking down, he saw Crookshanks, Hermione's ginger cat, rubbing against his ankle affectionately. Good morning, Crookshanks, Blake greeted, picking up the cat. What? You say it's noon? No, no, it's still morning if it's not yet twelve o'clock. Blake and Crookshanks' conversation was cut short when Hannah approached, looking distraught after a harsh critique from Snape. Blake offered her some advice on dealing with Snape, suggesting that surpassing him in potions would prevent any further trouble. As they sat in the dining hall, Cassandra handed Blake a copy of the Daily Prophet, and the conversation shifted to finding Sirius Black. Blake hinted at a plan involving Crookshanks, knowing the cat's connection to Sirius. Hannah, curious about how Blake managed to avoid Snape's wrath despite missing classes, pressed him for answers. Blake's evasion of Snape's classes and his shameless admission of just waking up drew a mix of reactions. The conversation took a serious turn when Blake mentioned the Ministry of Magic's potential doubts about Professor Dumbledore's stance, leaving the group pondering the implications. Throughout these interactions, Blake's resourcefulness and his relationships with both his peers and the magical creatures of Hogwarts were highlighted, showcasing his unique approach to navigating the challenges of wizarding school life. Channeling his anger into appetite, Blake focused intently on devouring the food before him. Once sated, he turned his attention to the newspaper that had been lying beside him. Curiosity peaked. What's new in the newspaper? Blake inquired unfolding the paper to scan the headlines. In the newspaper, it says Sirius's bounty has been increased again. Blake mused, a glimmer of hope sparking within him. Perhaps, with this news, Snape might not be as harsh with him. Let's make a deal, he suddenly proposed, an idea forming in his mind. Huh? Why do you look so surprised? It's simple, really. I just managed to surpass Snape in potions, Blake explained with a hint of pride in his voice. Hey, have you washed your hands? You've just come from potions class. His friend reminded him, concern laced in their tone. Blake paused, realizing the importance of hygiene, especially after a potions class that often involved handling various ingredients. He nodded, acknowledging the oversight, and made a mental note to maintain cleanliness, especially before meals. This moment between friends highlighted not only the importance of personal achievements and ambitions, but also the significance see, of maintaining health and hygiene, even in the magical world of Hogwarts. Chapter 4 and 18. Blake, what? Am I the culprit? Blake glanced at the moving picture of Sirius Black in the newspaper, who appeared to be shouting in silence. He then placed the newspaper on the table, a look of contemplation on his face. I must admit, this situation is indeed quite peculiar, he mused. The evidence against Sirius seemed irrefutable, and Dumbledore had personally vouched for the truth. Under normal circumstances, this would lead to the immediate revocation of the wanted order, followed by a public clarification in the newspapers, and ultimately, Peter Pettigrew's arrest for trial. However, the Ministry of Magic's actions, or lack thereof, suggested a different agenda. It appeared they were in a rush to have Sirius executed. Cassandra opened her mouth to add something, but Blake raised a hand to stop her. This isn't the place to discuss such matters, he cautioned, noting the increasing number of students filling the auditorium for their meals. The bustling environment was hardly conducive to a serious conversation. Without another word, Blake downed his honey water, grabbed the newspaper, and exited the auditorium, with Cassandra trailing behind him. Hannah, who had overheard part of their conversation, didn't give it much thought. 
She trusted Blake's ability to handle the situation and decided that focusing on her meal was a more practical choice. What do we do now? Cassandra asked in a hushed tone once they were out of earshot of others. We need to find Sirius before the Ministry does, Blake replied, his voice calm and determined. But we don't know where he is, Cassandra pointed out, her hands spread in a gesture of helplessness. I already have a plan, Blake said, glancing at the Daily Prophet in his hand. First, we need to check if Professor Dumbledore has returned. If everything went smoothly, he should have been back last night. If he's still at the Ministry, unaware of the situation, then we're facing a more complicated issue. Blake stroked his chin thoughtfully, sensing the possibility of a deeper conspiracy at play. It was clear that someone wanted Sirius dead, turning a case that could be easily resolved into one that seemed irrefutable. The question was, who stood to gain the most from Sirius's death? It could be someone within the Ministry of Magic, perhaps even Fudge himself. In Blake's view, the higher-ups in the Ministry were not to be underestimated. Fudge's apparent reliance on Dumbledore's reputation suggested that he was still struggling to assert his authority. Over the years, Fudge had often sought Dumbledore's approval before making significant decisions, not because he was incompetent, but because he needed the support of a powerful ally. Dumbledore, for his part, showed little interest in political power, but his involvement gave Fudge's decisions an air of legitimacy. This arrangement had kept Fudge in a stable position for years, but now it seemed Fudge was facing a dilemma. The Ministry's internal opposition was not easily quelled, yep. and Dumbledore was a formidable figure not easily dismissed. Fudge's decision to distance himself from Dumbledore, as suggested by the Daily Prophet's coverage, was intriguing. It hinted at a shift in the political landscape, one that Blake was keen to understand. The situation was complex, but Blake was determined to unravel the mystery and protect Sirius from an unjust fate. As Blake approached the principal's office, he encountered Professor McGonagall descending the stairs. Good morning, Professor, Blake greeted with respect. Good day, Blake. Though it's already afternoon, Professor McGonagall corrected him with her usual attention to detail. Right. Good day, Professor. Have you just returned from the principal's office? Yes, Albus visited the Ministry of Magic yesterday and hasn't returned yet. No one came for Peter last night and today's newspaper. Professor McGonagall's expression was laden with worry, clearly troubled by the unusual happenings at the Ministry of Magic. Professor McGonagall, don't worry. I am confident Professor Dumbledore will resolve these issues, Blake reassured her, his faith in Dumbledore unwavering. I hope so. It's just that I've sent two owls to him this morning and there's still no response, Professor McGonagall said, her frown deepening with concern. Blake understood the gravity of the situation upon hearing that Dumbledore had not yet returned. It seemed that Fudge had distanced himself from Dumbledore, showing indifference to potentially offending him. This could explain why Hogwarts' letters might not be reaching Dumbledore. Blake speculated that Dumbledore was likely preoccupied with matters Fudge had exaggerated in importance. Perhaps the owl was delayed or it missed Professor Dumbledore. We can always send another letter, Blake suggested, then softly called, Fox! In a flash of red light, the phoenix fox appeared on Blake's arm, nuzzling his face affectionately. Blake had chosen Fox for this task because his primary magical creatures were stored in pokeballs to enhance their bloodlines, including his ice phoenix. Observing this, Professor McGonagall quickly prepared a piece of parchment, Blake offered her a pen, sparing her the search for a quill. After she finished writing, she folded the parchment and handed it to Fox. Fox, ensure this letter reaches Professor Dumbledore directly. Do not send it otherwise, Blake whispered to the phoenix. Despite his low voice, Professor McGonagall, standing nearby, overheard him. Your tone suggests someone intercepted my letters to Albus, she inquired, puzzled. Professor, it seems every letter from Hogwarts is being read before reaching its destination, whether it's yours or the ones Professor Dumbledore sent to Minister Fudge, Blake explained. But why would that be? Professor McGonagall asked, clearly confused. Blake chose not to answer directly, but instead asked, When did you send your first letter, and did it mention Peter Pettigrew? The first letter was sent last night, 
merely inquiring about Albus's return. It didn't mention Peter, she replied, and the second letter, sent about an hour ago, this time mentioning Peter. Is there a problem? Professor McGonagall asked, still puzzled. Professor McGonagall, this might not be the time for such questions, Blake said gravely. If I'm correct, the Ministry of Magic's representatives to take Peter are on their way. They should have arrived long ago. Bringing Peter in for questioning would hasten the truth's revelation, she remarked. No, Professor, please do not hand Peter over to the Ministry of Magic, at least not to this group, Blake urged solemnly. Why not, she asked, taken aback. Blake explained, the Ministry intercepted your letter, so they're aware Dumbledore went to Fudge last night to argue for Peter's rehabilitation. Serious, Blake exclaimed, his voice tinged with urgency. Professor, someone within the Ministry of Magic harbors a desire for Sirius's demise, and Peter Pettigrew is the linchpin in their plan. Professor McGonagall, visibly perplexed by Blake's assertion, hesitated. But, wait. Blake realized the importance of convincing Professor McGonagall. Without her cooperation, his plan would falter. Professor, Professor Dumbledore visited the Ministry of Magic last night for a meeting with Minister Fudge. It stands to reason that Minister Fudge is now aware that Pettigrew is here at Hogwarts. Why then, did no one from the Ministry come to apprehend Pettigrew last night? She questioned. From last night until now, the Ministry has conspicuously ignored Pettigrew's presence, despite him being a known fugitive. Why do you think that is? Blake prodded. Professor McGonagall nodded, a light of understanding beginning to dawn. Indeed, that is peculiar. While Minister Fudge was preoccupied with detaining Professor Dumbledore at the Ministry, he also intensified the manhunt for Sirius in the newspapers. My theory is that over the course of the night, Fudge negotiated with certain individuals. Yet, for reasons unknown, he failed to disclose Pettigrew's location at Hogwarts to them. Blake explained. And your letter earlier, it informed those very individuals that Pettigrew is here at Hogwarts. Professor McGonagall's lips were a tight line, her mind racing to piece together Blake's deductions. Though she found his theory somewhat far-fetched, her trust in Blake, founded on his past insights, compelled her to consider his words seriously. Anyone else might have been dismissed outright. Well, if your speculation is incorrect, the worst outcome is a missed opportunity for vindication. But if you're right, then Pettigrew is in grave danger. Should anything happen to him, Sirius's chances of exoneration could vanish, she reasoned. To err on the side of caution, I will follow your advice. With that, Professor McGonagall hurried off to instruct Snape to conceal Pettigrew, planning to later claim that Pettigrew had escaped should anyone from the Ministry inquire. This way, if Blake's concerns were unfounded, Pettigrew could be recaptured at any time. Watching her leave, Cassandra voiced her concern. Is the situation truly that dire? It shouldn't have been, Blake admitted, spreading his hands in a gesture of helplessness. But an unforeseen complication has arisen. He pondered the implications of his upcoming time travel. Unlike Dumbledore, who had imprisoned Grindelwald for decades, altering the timeline could have significant repercussions. Fudge, seeing Dumbledore as a formidable ally, sought to leverage Grindelwald's equally influential but more notorious reputation to his advantage. Fudge is banking on Grindelwald's support in the future. If the fear of Dumbledore keeps certain individuals in line, the fear of Grindelwald ensures their absolute compliance, Blake mused. The revelation that Grindelwald's release, and by extension, the current predicament, was inadvertently facilitated by Blake himself, was a bitter pill to swallow. By using financial incentives to sway Fudge, Blake had unknowingly set the stage for these events. In essence, Grindelwald represents a more palatable crutch for Fudge than Dumbledore ever could. And now, it seems I've inadvertently become the architect of my own dilemma, Blake concluded, the irony of the situation not lost on him. The realization that one might discard an unreliable support in favor of a stronger one underscored the precarious nature of alliances and the unforeseen consequences of Blake's actions. Grindelwald's release from prison had unforeseen consequences, influencing the political landscape in ways that were initially hard to predict. At the heart of these developments was the relationship between Grindelwald and Dumbledore, which had taken an unexpected turn. 
Fudge, the Minister for Magic, found himself caught in the middle of this intricate web of alliances and betrayals. The situation was complex, but at its core, it boiled down to a simple truth. Fudge had been manipulated into siding with Dumbledore. Blake pondered over this revelation, his thoughts deep and troubled. As he considered the chain of events, a realization dawned on him. The connection between cause and effect was clear. Grindelwald's release, which seemed inconsequential at first, had set off a series of events that ultimately led to Fudge's decision to distance himself from Dumbledore. It was as if Grindelwald's mere presence had the power to alter the course of history, his influence extending far beyond the walls of his prison cell. Fudge's actions were not entirely his own. Behind the scenes, Grindelwald had been pulling the strings, using his newfound position as an honorary advisor to the minister to shape the ministry's policies to his liking. His political donations had bought him not just a prestigious title but real power within the Ministry of Magic. The revelation that Grindelwald was behind the change in ownership of the Daily Prophet was the final piece of the puzzle. It was clear that Grindelwald's ambitions extended far beyond personal freedom. He sought to control the very heart of the wizarding world's political system. In this tangled web of politics and power, Fudge found himself a pawn in a much larger game. His decision to abandon Dumbledore was not a sign of personal betrayal, but a calculated move influenced by Grindelwald's machinations. The realization that one man could wield such influence was a sobering thought. Grindelwald's ability to manipulate the Minister for Magic meant that, in a way, he had nominal control over the British Ministry of Magic itself. As Blake reflected on these developments, he couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The implications of Grindelwald's influence were far-reaching, affecting not just the political landscape, but the very fabric of wizarding society. The battle for power was no longer confined to the shadows. It was being fought in the open, with the fate of the wizarding world hanging in the balance. Chapter 419, The Dumbledore of Today is Not the Dumbledore of Then. As the afternoon approached, Dumbledore finally made his way back to Hogwarts from the Ministry of Magic. His solemn expression was a clear indicator that things had not gone as smoothly as he had hoped. It was a shock to him that Fudge, who had always shown him the utmost respect and heeded his advice, had decided to play such tricks on him. Fudge's avoidance only seemed to confirm his guilt. Upon returning to his office, Dumbledore requested some food from the house elf. However, the honey-glazed grilled wings, which he usually found delectable, now seemed tasteless. With a heavy heart, he set aside his knife and fork. There was a knock on the door, and Blake entered. Dumbledore looked up, a bitter smile on his face. Do you know what happened? I wasn't aware initially, but after reading today's newspaper, I had my suspicions, Blake replied, noticing the untouched plate in front of Dumbledore. Your appetite seems to have diminished, Dumbledore sighed deeply. It's such a blatant truth, such a clear injustice. A single trial for Peter would unveil everything, but they, including Fudge, why would they resist this? I'm not sure of their exact motives, but I've enlisted someone to investigate on your behalf, Blake stated calmly. You've asked someone? How? Dumbledore was taken aback. I've always believed in helping others. In doing so, I find that people are often willing to offer their assistance in return, Blake explained with a smile. Dumbledore looked at him with a glimmer of hope. Blake's demeanor was far from worried. Peter is safely hidden by us. As long as that remains true, there's no cause for concern. You could find a way too, Professor, but you generally avoid such methods, Blake remarked thoughtfully. Dumbledore's white beard quivered, but he chose to remain silent. With his capabilities and wisdom, manipulating the situation to sideline fudge and take control of the Ministry of Magic would be simpler than his past confrontations with Grindelwald. If he wished, he could easily hold the positions of both Headmaster and Minister of Magic simultaneously. However, Dumbledore feared the allure of power. He doubted his ability to resist its temptations and, to prevent himself from potentially abusing his power, he chose to step back from controlling it. This decision also meant abandoning any practices that would influence power directly. Thus, despite being the most powerful wizard of the century, he felt powerless against Fudge's machinations. 
Blake believed that rules were designed to restrain the virtuous, and Dumbledore was the epitome of such virtue. If only Dumbledore could overcome his aversion to power. Even now, a simple message from him to someone within the ministry could rally support. Dumbledore had more allies than he realized. Yet, he refrained from taking such actions, which is why Blake suggested he had methods he chose not to employ. Dumbledore understood Blake's point but remained unwilling to change his stance. To do so, he feared, would make him no different from Grindelwald. What can be done? Dumbledore inquired after a moment of silence. I have a plan, but it requires your assistance, Blake replied. And the plan is? It's straightforward. First, we find Sirius. Second, we ensure the trial can proceed without interference. Third, we protect both individuals from harm. Fourth, we complete the trial. Dumbledore listened, feeling a mix of helplessness and resolve. Except for the second step, the others seemed feasible. The crucial part I need your help with is ensuring the trial proceeds as planned, Blake concluded, laying out the path forward. The courtroom can proceed as usual, Blake stated, seemingly able to discern Dumbledore's thoughts and addressing them directly. Dumbledore felt a sense of helplessness regarding the second step because of a particular obstacle within the Ministry of Magic. Even with Minister Fudge's opposition, if he wished for the trial to be conducted feral, he would need to employ tactics he had previously avoided, personally intervening to sway the powers that be. Otherwise, the likely fate for Peter Pettigrew and Sirius Black would be a direct handover to the Dementors for their souls to be consumed without a trial. Professor, although you've always maintained a distance from direct power, your frequent correspondence with Secretary Fudge has, in a way, allowed you to influence decisions, hasn't it? Blake pointed out with a matter-of-fact tone. Dumbledore paused, taken aback, then sighed deeply. He rubbed his eyebrows, a wry smile forming. Blake's observation was accurate. In the past, Fudge's overt flattery ensured Dumbledore's endeavors faced little resistance, thanks to the Minister of Magic's backing. But now, with Fudge's support withdrawn, Dumbledore found himself at a loss, struggling to rectify even a case with clear evidence and a path to vindication. In essence, despite my reluctance to engage with power, its shadow has always lingered around me, Dumbledore admitted, meeting Blake's gaze. You're correct, Blake. Perhaps today marks the first time I've felt utterly disconnected from any form of power. Dumbledore's agreement was clear, yet he harbored concerns about being corrupted by power once more. Don't worry, Professor. You're not the same Dumbledore you once were, are you? Blake reassured him. I believe you'll remain true to your principles. Dumbledore was momentarily speechless, touched by Blake's insight into his inner turmoil. Yes, I am no longer the ambitious man I once was, Dumbledore acknowledged with a smile of relief. The realization that power was still necessary to wield dawned on him, especially considering the potential threat of Grindelwald's influence over the British Ministry of Magic. Just then, an owl swooped into the office through the window, carrying a letter. Dumbledore prepared to receive it, but the owl circled him and landed on Blake's arm instead. Apologies, Professor. This letter is for me, Blake said feeding the owl a small dried fish before it departed. Dumbledore noticed a small emblem on the owl's neck, but couldn't discern its details. Blake opened the letter and soon shared its contents with a smile. My friend has uncovered the root of the issue. Oh! Dumbledore expressed his surprise, intrigued. It all comes back to the goblins of Gringotts, Blake revealed. Gringotts? But the Ministry of Magic and Gringotts operate independently. How are they connected? Dumbledore inquired, puzzled. The times are changing, Professor. When the goblins learn to leverage their vast wealth, they become a formidable force, Blake explained, handing the letter to Dumbledore. Upon reading it, Dumbledore's expression shifted to one of shock. The Shafiq family, so it was them all along. The revelation that the Shafiq family was involved hinted at a complex web of power and influence extending beyond the Ministry of Magic and into the financial realms controlled by Gringotts' goblins. This new information promised to unravel further mysteries and challenges that lay ahead. Among the 28 sacred families listed in the Pure Blood Directory, the Shafiq family had experienced a severe decline. Their numbers had dwindled, and poverty had beset them, 
mirroring the downfall of the Gaunt family. Without any unforeseen circumstances, it seemed inevitable that the Shafiq family would fade into the annals of magical history like many pure-blood families before them. However, in recent years, the Shafiq family's fortunes had taken a dramatic turn for the better. Not only had they escaped the clutches of poverty, but the current head of the family, Clarence Shafiq, had also ascended to a position within the Wizengamot of the British Ministry of Magic. This transformation was astonishing. Clarence went from struggling for basic necessities to becoming a high-ranking official in the Ministry of Magic in a remarkably short period. Albus Dumbledore, as the chief wizard of the Wizengamot, was naturally well in form, at about Clarence. I've been puzzled by the sudden resurgence of the Shafiq family, Dumbledore mused. It appears they've gained the support of the goblins. The Shafiq family's return to affluence, followed by Clarence's easy entry into the Wizengamot, was indeed noteworthy. It's more accurate to say that he has become a puppet for the goblins, Blake corrected. Historically, goblins and wizards have had a contentious relationship, marked by conflict. Though the goblins were defeated, the wizards didn't emerge unscathed. It seems the goblins haven't given up. They've found a new strategy to infiltrate the very heart of wizarding power, the Ministry of Magic. No one anticipated their willingness to invest financially, Blake observed, noting the shift from the goblins' traditionally miserly behavior to their current strategy of financially backing puppets. This revelation sparked a sense of excitement in Blake, a reminder of the endless mysteries the world held. The ministry under Fudge's leadership is preoccupied with its dignity and credibility, Blake continued, feeling a surge of adventurous spirit. I'll make sure the Wesengamot Tribunal opens a trial on this matter. Dumbledore, after hearing Blake's plan and reading the letter he had provided, remarked, Compared to the vast wealth of the Blake family, the goblin's investment in the Shafiq family is insignificant. I trust you with this matter, Dumbledore said earnestly, finding the situation more intriguing than he had initially thought. Blake smiled, reassured by Dumbledore's confidence. I've also reached out to my friends to locate Sirius. It's natural for children to have their secrets as they grow. Besides, Dumbledore had resolved not to constrain Blake's freedom, mindful of his future time-traveling endeavors. Upon leaving Dumbledore's office, Blake felt a clear sense of direction. Identifying the enemy simplifies our next steps. The primary culprits are the goblins, with certain ministry officials led by Fudge playing a secondary role. And then there are those individuals Blake would encounter in his future travels. Though Blake remained silent on these matters, Dumbledore chose not to press him, recognizing the complexity of the world they inhabited. The goblins' motive is clear. They covet the last heir of the Blake family's vast fortune stored in Gringotts, Dumbledore realized, piecing together the information Blake's friend had uncovered. The goblins' manipulation of the Shafiq family was a means to an end, aiming to access the Blake family's wealth. Dumbledore found the situation peculiar yet compelling. So, the goblins are the orchestrators behind this scheme, all for the Blake family's wealth in Gringotts? This revelation shed new light on the case, highlighting the lengths to which the goblins would go to achieve their financial ambitions, even if it meant manipulating the wizarding world's political landscape. Affecting the image of the Ministry of Magic in the eyes of the public is a concern for everyone, Dumbledore mused, his voice carrying a weight of understanding. After all, who doesn't harbor a few secrets, be it a goblin, a vampire, or a master of the chaos wish? He handed the letter back to Blake, his gaze sharpening. A flicker of doubt crossed his mind, making him wonder if the friend Blake referred to could possibly be himself. Dumbledore's thoughts drifted to Cornelius Fudge, the current minister for magic. Fudge is keen on maintaining the ministry's reputation during his tenure, he reflected. Much like how Blake has discreetly cultivated plants in the Room of Requirement. His trust in Blake was not unfounded. Blake had proven himself reliable time and again. The topic of Sirius Black, however, was a more delicate matter. When wealth becomes unclaimed, it naturally falls into the hands of the goblins, Dumbledore said, touching upon the complex issue of magical inheritance and property rights. Yet he was aware that there were certain questions he couldn't, or perhaps shouldn't, ask. 
Dumbledore's eyes narrowed slightly as he pondered the intricacies of their situation. The balance between secrecy and transparency was a fine line to walk, especially when it involved the Ministry of Magic and its public image. He knew that navigating these waters required a delicate touch, one that respected the secrets of individuals while safeguarding the interests of the wider magical community. Chapter 420, Will Three Hermiones Be Happier? After leaving the headmaster's office, Blake didn't head back to his dormitory or the room of requirement. Instead, he made his way to the secluded edge of the Forbidden Forest. With a careful glance around, utilizing his true eye, he quickly realized his luck wasn't on his side today. There was no sign of Sirius within a one-kilometer radius, suggesting Sirius might still be wandering around Hogsmeade or perhaps deeper within the Forbidden Forest. Undeterred, Blake ventured into the heart of the forest. Upon reaching a particularly ancient tree, he pressed his hand against its trunk. A ray of green light emanated from his palm, infusing into the tree. Almost immediately, the canopy above began to rustle, sending a message through the forest in a language only the trees could understand. The rustling soon ceased, replaced by the sound of animals moving through the underbrush. Blake removed his hand, leaving behind a glowing green palm print on the tree. Observing the increasing number of animals gathering around, he smiled slightly and then vanished into the shadows of the trees. A soundless bird landed on the branch near the palm print, cocking its head curiously before taking off into the sky. Soon after, a diverse array of magical and mundane animals congregated around the tree. Despite being natural enemies, an unusual peace prevailed among them. After acknowledging the palm print, they seemed to reach a mutual understanding and dispersed. Meanwhile, in Hogsmeade, Mrs. Aliska was feeding her cats and dogs in the yard, feeling a chill as if someone was watching her. Turning around, she expected to find someone at the gate, but was greeted instead by the sight of a large, malnourished black dog. Oh, what do we have here? A little unfortunate soul, Mrs. That Aliska murmured, setting aside her food to approach the gate. The dog, silent and unmoving, fixed its gaze on the food on the ground. Sensing its hunger, Mrs. Aliska fetched half a chicken from her basket and opened the gate. Poor thing, you must be starving. Here, eat up, she said, placing the chicken before the dog. To her surprise, the dog exhibited a momentary look of vigilance, almost human-like, before it began to eat the chicken in small, reluctant bites. Mrs. Aliska couldn't help but notice something off about the dog's behavior. It seemed hungry, yet disgusted by the food. Concerned that the dog might be ill, Mrs. Aliska went inside to grab her pet medical kit. However, when she returned, the dog was gone, leaving behind only a few scattered chicken bones as evidence of its presence. In a small nook under a stone bridge crossing a winding river at the edge of Hogsmeade, the black dog found refuge. It curled up in the darkness, and in front of it lay the half-eaten chicken, a testament to its struggle between hunger and pride. Sirius Black eyed the half-eaten chicken before him with a mixture of hunger and disgust. As an animagus, transforming into an animal didn't alter his taste preferences entirely. Unlike Nagini, who, being a humanoid snake, found the scent of fish irresistible, Sirius retained his human aversion to raw meat. Yet, under his current dire circumstances, this raw chicken was a feast compared to the wild mice he had been forced to subsist on. With no luxury to be choosy, he gnawed on the chicken, contemplating his next move. The sky above him darkened, mirroring the turmoil within as he considered the risks of sneaking into Hogwarts. The village of Hogsmeade had been bustling with more witches and wizards lately, a sign that the Dementor's presence hadn't deterred the magical community as much as hoped. The residents, resistance had kept the Dementors at bay for now, but Sirius knew this stalemate couldn't last. The thought of Hogwarts under martial law made his decision urgent. Moreover, an inexplicable sense of foreboding had plagued him all day, hinting at unseen dangers. His thoughts were interrupted by voices above the bridge. What? Sirius is an animagus? One voice exclaimed. Yes, and D his form is a large black dog, another confirmed. The conversation revealed that Sirius's secret was out, and reinforcements were being called. A wave of despair washed over Sirius as he realized his last shred of anonymity had vanished. Only a handful of people knew of his animagus ability. Peter Pettigrew, the true traitor, 
was unlikely to have divulged it, leaving Remus Lupin as the possible informant. Despite a surge of anger towards Lupin, Sirius couldn't hold it against him. From Lupin's perspective, revealing Sirius's secret to the Ministry was a logical step, given Sirius's framed reputation as a traitor. Resigned to his fate, Sirius knew he couldn't delay any longer. The cover of night was his ally, and he slipped out from under the bridge, determined to infiltrate Hogwarts and confront Pettigrew. If he could achieve that, even at the cost of his own life, he would have no regrets. As Sirius approached the Forbidden Forest, a ginger cat watched him silently from atop a stone. The cat's presence went unnoticed, as Sirius's mind was consumed with thoughts of vengeance. Meanwhile, in the Hufflepuff common room, Blake sat quietly, focused on mending a bag with alchemy. The sudden meow of a cat drew his attention, and he greeted Crookshanks with a warm smile. Blake didn't question how the cat had entered the common room, he was more concerned with the success of Crookshanks's mission. After receiving an affirmative meow, Blake rewarded the cat with a can of food and set aside the bag, preparing to write on a piece of parchment. This scene, bridging the desperate resolve of Sirius with the calm determination of Blake, sets the stage for unfolding events, highlighting the interconnectedness of their actions and the looming consequences of secrets revealed. Blake carefully placed the parchment on the table before him. With a practiced flick of his wand, he gently tapped the surface. In the next moment, countless lines began to emerge, weaving across the parchment until a detailed map of Hogwarts materialized before his eyes. Scattered across the map were numerous small black dots, each accompanied by a line of tiny text identifying the names associated with these markers. Indeed, this was a marauder's map, yet not the original crafted by the infamous marauders themselves. Rather, this was Blake's own rendition, an enhanced version he had created after studying the map he received from the Weasley twins. With his extensive knowledge gained under the tutelage of Nicholas Flamel and the aid of a magical plug-in, replicating and improving the map was hardly a challenge for Blake. That evening, Blake had utilized druid magic to communicate with the creatures of the Forbidden Forest, instructing them to monitor the movements of a certain black dog. This was how Crookshanks, the intelligent cat, came to know the whereabouts of the large black dog, Sirius Black, and subsequently led him into Hogwarts that very night. Blake had now confirmed Sirius's presence within the castle walls. The next step was pinpointing his exact location, a task for which the Marauder's Map was perfectly suited. Although Blake possessed the Eye of Truth, a magical ability that could directly locate Sirius, he preferred the map for its intuitive display and to avoid revealing his unique power. The map offered a straightforward means to find Sirius without compromising his secrets. His gaze swept over the map until he spotted a small stationary dot labeled Sirius Black, hidden within one of Hogwarts's many secret passages. Checking his watch, Blake noted it was 8.15 p.m. He surmised that Sirius, having been forced to act sooner than planned, was likely conserving his energy for movements under the cover of night. The secret passages of Hogwarts provided a safer haven for Sirius than the exposed grounds of Hogsmeade or the Forbidden Forest. Blake's thoughts were momentarily diverted by a letter from Lao Lepu informing him of a lengthy secretive discussion between Linji and Shafiq. Cornelius Fudge, the Minister for Magic, wouldn't engage in suck. H prolonged private talks without significant reason. Blake deduced that Fudge had leveraged the secret of Sirius's animagus ability, a detail unknown to the Ministry's aurors, to strike a beneficial deal with Shafiq. This revelation, undoubtedly shared by Dumbledore with Fudge the previous night, was crucial. However, Dumbledore's decision to divulge such information was made without the foresight of Fudge's betrayal. Returning his attention to the map, Blake shifted his focus from Sirius to Peter Pettigrew, who was currently with Severus Snape. Snape's intentions, whether they involved guarding or interrogating Peter, were of no concern to Blake. His mind was preoccupied with other matters, leaving no time for temporal interventions. The last person of interest was Hermione, seen heading towards the library. Blake pondered the significance of her actions, suspecting they might be linked to his own reasons for time travel. With Dumbledore absent from Hogwarts, having departed for the Ministry of Magic earlier that day, 
Blake felt a sense of urgency. He prepared a small pill bottle and secured it around Crookshank's neck before heading out. Good evening, Professor, Blake greeted as he opened the door, only to be met with Crookshank's meow in response. With a soft sigh, Blake stored the map away, his attention momentarily caught by Hermione's name on the map. Approaching Professor McGonagall's office, Blake knocked on the door, muttering to himself about the complexity of the situation. It's okay to administer the medicine as usual, he reassured himself before being greeted by Professor McGonagall's acknowledgement. Oh, Blake. Professor McGonagall set her quill aside and asked with a gentle tone, Is there something troubling you? The notion that having multiple Hermione's might lead to a happier outcome seemed perplexing. Currently, Hermione was in possession of a time-turner, a fact that McGonagall was aware of, yet it still troubled her that she was often the last to know about such matters. All right, you may leave after you've eaten. I have some tasks to attend to. It might not be a bad idea to pass this along to one of them, she mused, stroking Crookshank's head thoughtfully. She's pushing herself too hard. It's detrimental to her health. This will help her replenish. Please, come in, she said as Blake entered her office. Professor, I believe I've located Sirius, Blake announced with a grin. The situation with Hermione was indeed peculiar. With the aid of her time-turner, she had been seen in multiple places simultaneously, creating a sense of amusement and confusion within the castle. Eventually, the additional Hermione's vanished, leaving only the original. My main concern is delivering this medicine, but I'm uncertain which Hermione is the correct one in our current timeline, Blake admitted, his voice tinged with uncertainty. Upon hearing this, Professor McGonagall, with a slight tremor in her hand, adjusted her glasses. It's best if they don't encounter each other for now, she concluded. Blake's visit to Professor McGonagall's office was driven by his observation of Hermione's peculiar appearances in various locations at the same time, as seen on the Marauder's map. I, I'm hesitant to approach her directly, Blake confessed, waving his hand dismissively. Understanding the delicate nature of the situation, Professor McGonagall nodded. Dumbledore had promised to keep her informed about future developments, a gesture that underscored the importance of communication and trust within their community.